So I recently had the pleasure of interviewing Gareth Coker. He was the composer for games like Ori and the Blind Forest, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, Ark Survival Evolved, and now he's currently working on Halo Infinite. So I was really excited to talk with him, and I would recommend checking out the entire conversation because it's just packed full of value if you're a composer or producer. The link will be in the description. But there are five specific things that really just stuck with me that I wanted to share in this video. And if you don't know who I am, my name is Matt Kenyon. I host a podcast called Composer Code where I interview game composers. I'm a composer and producer and arranger and songwriter myself. And so if you are a media composer or you're a songwriter or producer, someone who makes music at home, definitely consider subscribing. Even though this is a uh, game composing centric, all of these tips can apply to really anyone who makes music. So let's get into the tips. So the first tip from Gareth was not to rely too heavily on the game engine to create the immersive experience for the player. You know, there are tons of amazing game implementation, audio implementation tools for composers and sound designers, things like FMOD and WISE and a bunch of other things that allow us to really tailor the experience to be as dynamic as possible for the player. Unfortunately, over-reliance on these tools can also be a detriment. For example, Gareth was telling me that originally they would have dynamic music play as Ori would encounter enemies and the music would kind of go on and off, on and off as you encounter an enemy and then go back to your default state, encounter an enemy, go back to the default state. And the end result was just kind of like this cheesy, very video gamey sound that didn't really match the mood. And so he described a better way forward, which is to look for switches or in-game triggers where the composer could work with the developers to say, okay, at this game event or at this particular mood or at this particular story beat, that's a good spot for the music to change. Very simple example a door opens a door closes very obvious place to change the music you, you finish a puzzle you have it you have a little stinger and then you have an excuse to change the music that happens after it mm -hmm. uh, best example very easy example um, that we've literally just talked about um, the environment in shadows of moldwood it plays dark music when you first enter shadows of moldwood when the environment is resolved in the same environment it plays a much lighter happier piece of music mm, I see. that's all a choice i could have totally not done that and just had the same environment piece of music play afterwards but that i was like well that's not going to fit the story um right. uh, another simple example uh opening of the game in will of the wisps ori split up from ku um very sad melody plays um it's called separated by the storm on the soundtrack um ori progresses through the environment eventually ori picks up the sword um a stinger plays a little cutscene plays and then the music that plays after in the same environment uses that same sad melody but hey ori has a sword now and the accompaniment is a bit more peppy because like hey finally something good happened um, wow. it's very very simple stuff but like those switches i'm like well we've taken away control from the player because it's a cutscene, and mm -hmm. so i can actually now if i wanted to and i do this elsewhere i can actually use the cutscene because it's a linear piece i can actually use the cutscene to modulate to a different key as well that's um, clever. Which you can't really do in a looping track. So rather than just like setting this blanket statement and relying on the game engine to determine the mood and the feel and the level of immersion for the player to actually go through, and this does require more effort, it requires more work, but to actually go through the game yourself and look and identify these triggers and these switches that can work for either layering music vertically or cross-fading horizontally. And when you take that sort of manual approach and use the game implementation tools, you get the best of both worlds and you get a deeply immersive experience, which translates perfectly into the second tip, which is to play the build of the game as early and as often as possible. This is something that Gareth stressed multiple times throughout the interview, and it was clearly like very important to him. And I think it is uh, one of the keys to the reason why the Ori series has such a beloved soundtrack and just a, a very immersive gameplay experience is that Gareth was heavily involved in all of the game builds uh, from a very early stage in the game's development. So. He would request game builds and he would play through them and he would let the feel of the game really contextualize the music. You know, in, in a lot of cases, you know, sometimes we just can't avoid this as composers is we we're kind of an afterthought. Um, we kind of get 
maybe pictures and 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 some footage of the game and then we kind of have to write from that and you know, that's okay sometimes there's just no choice in the matter sometimes we have to do that and uh, sometimes our music is just kind of like shoehorned in after the game's already done and gareth said as much as you can avoid that as much as you can be invested in the development cycle as possible it's going to produce a better experience one of the examples gareth gave for this being such an important factor was when he was composing the music for the luma pool area um, we do have some light, happy sounding stuff, but Luma Pools is, is pretty out there in terms of like how upbeat it is. Um, and you know, 4 2 is generally a sad game. So I was like a little bit uncertain, but I'm like, at the end of the day, look at the visuals and look at the gameplay. There is nothing truly unhappy about this area of the environment, even though there are critters. They're not really that dangerous. I would say it's the easiest area of the game to navigate. You've got mm. that crazy area with all the bubbles like going up. It's like, it's a very fun area in terms of gameplay and visuals. And I was like, that's what the music needs to reflect because for Ori and thus the player, that's how they're going to feel when they're going right. through this environment. Tip number three is not to be afraid to repeat, resurrect, and vary past themes. So there's, there can be this temptation with composers, and a lot of it is self-imposed, I think, where if we have a new project or a new track, we think, okay, this is you know my time to shine and create something brand new that the world's never heard before. Whether it's you know a new melodic material or a new music theory trick I just learned or a cool harmony, and you know maybe that can be suitable if the client wants that. But a lot of times when you're dealing with music and games that are all existing in one universe, it can actually be really rewarding and really cool to bring back certain motifs. I mean, if you go back and you listen to Super Mario 64 or Super Mario World or all the old Koji Kondo 90s Mario and Zelda games, they all are based on one core theme that then gets repeated throughout the game or even in the case of Zelda throughout the entire series. And Gareth even said, yeah, one of the first things we learn in composition class is theme and variation. So, I mean, it would be kind of silly not to resurrect that and bring that back. And there can be a little bit of self-consciousness like, oh, are people going to think I'm lazy because I'm just bringing back this old theme? But Gareth described how he brought back Ori's theme at a very key moment in the game in Ori 2. And it created this very nostalgic feeling of, oh my gosh, I know that, you know, like, especially if you played Ori 1, it probably hits you right in the feels. And even if you don't explicitly state that, you feel that as you're playing the game. So don't be afraid to utilize motifs, to bring back themes, to alter them, to make a major theme minor, a minor theme major, to change their instrumentation and their setting, because it can provide some really cool, really immersive um, experiences for the player that ties the whole game world together. Okay, so this is the tip. This next tip is the one that is still blowing my mind, and frankly, I just cannot wait to try. This was worth the price of admission alone to have this entire interview just to get this one tidbit. I mean, when I always go to the orchestra and I go to orchestral scoring, which I want to get better at, my my pieces always tend to sound very loopy and gamey. Like it's very clear this is like a looping piece, and it's like the the seam of the loop is very obvious. Um, do you have any any tips for someone like me who's maybe coming from like an electronic or chiptune style going into orchestration? You're going to laugh at this answer. I mean, because because I've been following this general guide basically since USC. Um, Christopher Young, the film score composer, is at least was, I think he still is a professor at USC. Um, he does a, a guest class every week. Um, he's done Drag Me to Hell, Spider-Man, a couple of other things. One of the best best lessons he taught me and taught the class was that he thought the best structure for film music and this is a man who scores intense horror movies like with really crazy aleatoric stuff going on he's like the best structure is the pop song structure um, and i'm like the very first time he said that I'm like, wait what the pop song structure and then he was like i'm going to show you the pop song structure in this crazy aleatoric piece and then when he he gave us the score and I'm like starting to look at it. I'm like, there's all this crazy stuff on the score. Right. But then you start to see the patterns and you're like, wait, this is the verse. 
And then he's like, yeah, this is the chorus. Wow. And you start to see it. And then it's like, yeah, this is verse two. And this is chorus two. And this is the bridge. And then this is the chorus three. And then the outro. In this aleatoric piece. That's crazy. Now, if you're not familiar with the pop song structure, it's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. Now this, it's still blowing my mind. It's so simple, but so genius. And I could not believe that I just didn't think about this. The thing, the, and the thing is, if you have a great structure for a track, you can rearrange it in multiple ways. And it's also not gonna get tiresome to listen to because you're, you're balancing that repetition with new content. You know, every every pop song, not every pop song, but most pop songs, intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, outro, something like, or something similar. Right. And that's enough variation, because you've just mentioned, oh, it has, you've just mentioned Midori, it has this ambient thing, verse one, chorus, melody, <laughs> um, and and I float between the two. Yeah. Um, let's take Shadows of Moldwood. It has an intro. Then you have the piano melody, verse one. Then you have the creepy strings part. Chorus one. Oh, wait, then we repeat the piano melody again with the solo violin, verse two. And then chorus two is a bigger version of the creepy strings build, chorus two. Um, and then you get to the, and then there's the outro, and then the track repeats again. So that's a much simpler variation of the pop song. But you could go through every single environment track on Ori, and I guarantee you, you could probably work out where the verse and the chorus are in each song. Because that's, to me, there's a reason why that length has lasted for as long as, as long as it has, like the three minute 40 pop song. Like look at most of the loops. They're probably between three to four and a half minutes. Um, Shadows of Moldwood is an exception because it's quite a slow track. Um, that's like five minutes, but they all follow a similar structure. So you get that natural variance with the verse and chorus and then a bridge if you want one. Mm -hmm. um, and then by the time you get to the end, you well, first of all, it also makes writing a bit easier because like once you've got your verse in your chorus, it's like, well, now I can like actually start to reuse material. Now shifting gears a little bit for tip number five, Gareth and I talked a little bit about the business side of composition, charging clients and working with clients, which is a huge, it's a huge skill set that composers need to know if they want to be uh, working composers in this industry or working producers, songwriters, arrangers, orchestrators, things like that. And one thing that he said, which I thought was super interesting, is to avoid, whenever you can, avoid the charge by the minute model. You're often subjected to the dreaded minute count. Like, oh, we, we need 60 minutes of our music music for this game. And I'm like, well, what if, you need, what if you need 65? What if you need 70? And you know, what if you need 90? Right. Um, you know, I projected that Ori 2 would need 150 minutes of music, but it actually ended up having 210. Like, wow. And that's partly my oh, choice because how, how can you possibly how can you possibly know yeah, at the beginning of a that game? Is, that you is can't. when you sign the contract, you have no idea. So I'm like, so basically, what what you know when when I'm like figuring out like my deal with uh, with a client, I'm like, like, let's try and get in the ballpark and like, what would I happy be doing the gig for? And then I'll figure out the rest. Like you know, mm. um, unless unless things get super crazy. Um, and the, the problem with the minute count is it. You know, you end up looking at these these loops, and it's like, yeah, we just need a ninety second loop. I the only time I write ninety second tracks of combat music because they they generally can be shorter. But right. boss tracks, you know, three three minutes because they you know they need to tell a story. Um, yeah. But um, and you can't write like a ninety second Ori track, like just because I feel you like can't because well the tempo is slow and it needs to you, you know most of my melodies are eight to sixteen bars, and so you're already you've already covered a minute for your section right. A. Yeah. And that's exactly Shadows of Moldwood is a perfect example. That long drawn out piano melody, it's long and drawn out. So you've got to take a minute. And it's like, well, if we're already at like 60 seconds. And so if I'm hitting the repeat point in 30 seconds from now, well, of course it's going to sound gamey and loopy mm -hmm. um, because we're hearing the same thing. So I'm like, well, screw it. I'll just write a chorus. And then how do I elongate this track? I'm like, hey, I wrote five minutes of music today with the Shadows of Moldwood track. But actually, did I really? Because honestly, I wrote two and a half minutes of music and then just copied it and then changed it slightly. So it's really two, two and a half minutes of material. And then it's arranging for two, two and a half minutes. And I think that fear hmm. of repetition and also the fear of developers of having long tracks because it ups the minute count can actually prevent you from like, you know, right. There's no excuse anymore. We're not limited by space or storage right. limitations. There's no, no, that, yeah. that's, that, that's a completely invalid excuse. The right. budget thing, I mean, that's up to every individual composer, like how they want to handle that. But mm -hmm. this is the one problem, and I'm not the only composer that thinks this. Um, 
It's the one problem with like the charging by the minute of music because you just can't possibly know. It's yeah. impossible. Right. Um, you know, every game has a, has a different requirement and you discover as you're scoring the game, like, oh, we need a bit of music here. We need a bit of music here. Right. Oh, there's a bit that needs music that I didn't even think about. Um, and so do you can... find it's better for you to say, like, I'm just going to charge by the project. I'm going to over, over, like, sort of review the entire project, what my perceived needs for this project, and then charge based on that. Is that a better strategy? That, that, that's one way of doing it. I mean, I think, I think what's good, you, you obviously need to try and scope it at the beginning because, like, so you, you need to have a rough idea, but it's like, yeah, if you have a target, let, let's just say we're using the minute count as a target. And it's like, well, look, okay, let's maybe do this minute count. And I'm happy doing it if the minute count, if the minute count is 20% less, and I still get paid the same, usually unlikely, especially in my case, because I generally write too much. But mm -hmm. also if the minute count is 20% more, then I'm like still fine doing it for, for this project. Like it's, right. you know, it just gives everyone a bit of flexibility. Sure. Um, and, you know, the developer might be like, well, you're going to try and like write less music so you can get paid more. And I'm like, no, I'm not. You've got to trust me to like actually. Yeah, there's got to be trust. The there's got to be so, trust there. Um, so it gives it gives leeway either way, because, you know, this this you know, always a game that has a lot of music by definition. Um, but, you know, there's going to be some games where you just like actually silence might be better here. Um, and that's a decision that the composer might have to take. And that's right. also part of the creative process. So, yeah, you kind of want to. I just think being limited to a very specific minute count is a bad way to go. You, you need to work out a deal, either like a full package, like what you were just describing, that you're like happy to do the project for, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it, and then you just have to be careful that it doesn't get stupid. It's like, well, we, you know, we expected 90 minutes of the project and now you've got to do six hours. Well, obviously that's like not good, but, right. um, and it's, you know, it's unreasonable, but generally having a target minute count and then like giving you some leeway either way um gives you gives you the flexibility to um do, do the score that's best for the project if the developer were to say we need 20 percent more music would i be okay with that at this price and it's so simple but it makes so much sense if you just evaluate the project with how excited are you to work on this project if you're more excited you'll probably be willing to take less money if you're eh, not that excited about it you'll probably want to charge more money but it's really a matter of looking at the project determining how excited I am to work on this and to just ask yourself that 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 buffer question a buffer of 20% it could be 30% 40% whatever you want if they asked me to write 20% more music would I be okay with that would I be excited enough about this project to be okay with that well that's it guys those are all the tips now there's tons of more insight that you'll get from this interview if you listen to the whole thing we talked for an hour we probably could have talked uh, for another hour at least and so the link for that is going to be in the description also if you're interested in getting some free training on composition i've put a course together all about the fundamentals of composing game audio you can sign up for a free preview of that course and get access to a few lessons for free if you want to take your composition skills to the next level and build a strong foundation of melody harmony and arrangement i'd love to uh, to give that to you for free well guys uh definitely check out the website composercode.com for more resources on creating video game music and music of any kind really and yeah it's been great if you want to subscribe that'd be awesome today's my birthday true story i'm 31 years old all right bye